Hey folks, Nathan here. In the very recent past, I did a video that was a content overview for all of the knockdown Kickstarter from Waken Realms Light. We looked at every single component found in Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3, including taking a look at the source material that all these fighters have come from, along with looking at the two standalone characters that someone could pick up. What I promised at the time was that I would return with a how to play video. The reason I'm doing this, and I don't usually do how to play videos, I did one ages and ages and ages ago for, oh gosh, Star Wars Empire vs. Rebellion or whatever it was called. I did one for Imperial Assault. I did one for like a Han Solo Sabat game type of thing. I really don't tend to do how to play videos. I'm more focused on showing the content of the Kickstarters in detail and just sort of hinting at some of the game mechanics while I go along doing that. But this is a game that I really enjoy. I've gotten into it quite a bit. I was excited for it. I'm backer number two over on Kickstarter for this thing. And what I'm finding is that when I look online for things like how to play videos for this game, most of them are from a few years ago, maybe two years ago, give or take on average. And that tends to mean that they're about the prototype. And the prototype of this game changed drastically to get it into its final form that was then released, which means that most of those how to play videos aren't accurate anymore. So what I want to do is kind of show you here how to play Knockdown as quickly as I can here, along with specifics about how the different characters play so you can make a decision on perhaps which of these games out of the three volumes you might want to pick up and whether you want to pick up either of those standalone characters, though I would note that Chili the Business Penguin is a Kickstarter exclusive. So let's dive into how to play Knockdown. The first thing that's going to happen is each player, this is a two-player game, each of the two players is going to pick which character they're playing with. I've grabbed the characters here and we're going to be using the components for Volume 1. I know it's kind of vanilla, but that's kind of the point here. I want to show you the most basic rules of the game and then dive into more specifics. And as far as basic game mechanics go, these two here, Shingo and Veroth, they are the most vanilla of the characters you could play as. They're from Siege Storm, and they are the only ones in the entire game library at this point that don't require a help card, like Driana here, for special game mechanics just for them. So we're going to take the cards here, one for each player, and their corresponding miniatures. If we were playing with another character, we'd need their help card as well. Speaking of help cards, each player also gets one of these, a generic help card for the game. Now, for some reason, it's not mentioned anywhere in the instructions, probably because this was something they added late in the process of the Kickstarter, but you'd think it would have been added by the time the final game was released. But you do need to actually pick which class you're playing as. Each character has two different possible classes with different moves. Usually there's at least one or two moves that carry over. These are your special attacks that will carry over from side to side. Like in this case, concentration is on either side. But you want to make sure that you choose the one that fits the play style that you have in mind. We're going to go with Shingo being the Javelin class and Veroth being the Berserk class. Next up, we need to set up our arena. The arena is found once you open the box and take out the plastic insert with all the pieces by flipping over the bottom of the box. You'll know the front by the fact that it has the Knockdown logo. You can take the top of the box, which has scenery on here, and put it behind to create a nice diorama-style playing area. Now, because the back has no gameplay role, I'm going to leave it off of here so it's easier for us to see the entire play area without this looming and casting shadows in the background. Every arena is made up of hexes. In this case, eight for volume one. Volume two and three have nine hexes each. We'll look at those eventually here. And each will have their starting spots marked, which may be a different distance apart depending on which one we're looking at. Each player is going to place there are many onto one of the starting spaces, in this case that are marked with an orange outline instead of yellow. You then have 12 skill cards. Skill cards, which have different backs depending on which set they are from, are basically an ongoing ability of some kind and an initiative value. You're going to take that deck of 12 skill cards and shuffle it. What you'll do with these is deal out three to each player. Each player will then look through their three, decide which one they want to keep, and take it. We'll assume that Shingo is going to keep the heavy kick here. From the other batch of cards, we will assume that uh, Veroth is going to take Retreat. So now each of them have two left. They then exchange them, and now from the two that are left that the other person didn't pick, 
they will each choose one. We'll assume that Shingo is going to take Sprinter and that Veroth is going to take Adaptation. There are now two left, one with each player. These just go back in the box unused. For either player, they take their two cards and decide which one they want to use starting with the first round. Now, if you are never defeated, that's the only one you're ever going to see, as we will see as we go along here. So pick wisely, noting also that the person who goes in the first round will be whoever has the highest initiative value, either in this case eight or four are what this character could choose from, but they're really focused on starting out first. They can take Sprinter. Eight's a pretty good number for that. On the other hand, giving your low kick the KO symbol to initiate a knockdown test is actually a pretty cool thing. So this character, this is Shingo, is going to go with heavy kick, even though it only has the four, and that may mean he goes second at the beginning. So you'll take the one, the other goes upside down, essentially underneath, because it is out of play. That will only come into play if you lose a round. Otherwise, this initial skill is the only one you'll have throughout the entire game. Turns out here that Veroth actually has two very low initiative ones, so he's going to go with Adaptation. It's the most likely to be helpful to him, probably, rather than Retreat. But it really doesn't matter in this case, because all I'm doing is showing you sort of a gameplay demo here. We're not going to play an entire game once we see how to play. So he flips, and he's good to go with Adaptation. Next, you have 36 attack cards for that specific arena. Anytime you play with a particular arena, you will always play with the 36 attack cards that go with it. Those are not interchangeable. Skills are, characters are, but not attack cards. The 36 cards in the attack deck, regardless of which set you're playing with, will always include seven copies of high punch, seven copies of low punch, six copies of high kick, six copies of low kick, and five copies each of two cards that are specific to just that arena. In this case, Cut and Bash for the Siege Storm arena. Once you've shuffled them, you're going to deal out four into a row in front of the arena. At the beginning of the round, the first player is going to select one of these to keep. The second player then selects two to keep. Then the first player gets the one that's left. Then you refill that row with four again. Now, lastly, now that everybody has their character sheet, has their first two attack cards, has their one skill card with the face down one tucked underneath it, has a help card, has their character specific help card if they had one. Now that we have our attack deck ready to go, minus the eight cards we've already pulled out of it. Now that we have our skill cards just set off to the side because we're not gonna need them again. Now that we have our attack row here made up of four new cards, and our characters set up on their starting places on our arena, the last step is just to make sure we have everything else within reach. We'll need the cubes. That's the light and heavy wound cubes, as we'll talk about as we go along here. The dice we might be using if we're not going to use a dexterity mode of a knockdown test. I will show you both. And our victory tokens for whoever wins a given round. There are other components we might use, but not quite yet. So, the goal here is to take out your opponent in the best two out of three rounds, which of course means that if you win two in a row, there is no third round. It's very much akin to something like the Street Fighter series. And just like you used the initiative on the skill card to determine who was the first player when it came to that initial drafting of who took the first versus the two second versus the first person getting the one that was left, you also do the same thing here in terms of turn order for the first round. In subsequent rounds, whoever has lost the previous round gets to go first. But for the first round, it's whoever has that higher initiative number. In this case, we have three for Veroth. We have four for Shingo. So Shingo, this guy here, would go first. On your turn, the first thing you do is you make sure to refill this row with attack cards if there aren't four up there. At the start of the game, of course, there are, so nothing to do here. Then on your turn, you get to take two actions. And you must always take two. You can't just do one and then stop. You must do two. You have three options of what type of actions you can take, and those options are repeatable. You could do the same action twice or do two different actions. Either is perfectly fine. Your choices are move, attack, or combo. So the first option is to move, and you move one space at a time. So in the starting space here for Veroth, he could go back one, he could go forward one. That would be his move. There are some restrictions. 
Uh, barring any type of special ability that supersedes the rules because it's an ability on a card somewhere, you can't push an opponent's fighter out of its current space, which means essentially if you are here, you can't move forward and push him back. You're just stuck. You can't move forward anymore. You also can't move onto the space containing another character. If something somehow has given you multiple moves, you can't end on the same space as another character, and you can't move your character out of the arena. There is, however, a special type of move called a blink. Now, blinks are only provided in special situations by certain abilities, but essentially a blink lets you, for lack of a better term, sort of teleport or jump around the arena. It removes some of the movement restrictions. So if it says blink to any space, he could move anywhere, including going behind the enemy, so now they would sort of turn around and face each other, at least if you wanted your minis to kind of look logical. If it says blink within two, and he was here, he could blink here, here, or here, but still can't land on the other character because he has to end in an open space. But blink is the closest thing we have to sort of jumping over another character's head or teleporting in this game. Otherwise, you're basically always just kind of moving back and forth while the one who started on the left is on the left, the one that started on the right is on the right. Blinking is the only way to really flip that order. The second action you can choose on your turn is to attack. And this is just sort of a regular attack. It's not a super move or a combo or anything. It's just a regular attack. And that is going to come from this row here. You will pick one card from the row. You'll take that card and then go through what's referred to as the attack sequence. In that case, the little symbol up here in the corner in the red banner doesn't actually mean anything. It's all about the other stuff that's on the card. It's only once it's in your hand that the stuff in the red banner is going to mean anything. And in fact, once it is in your hand, nothing but the red banner will mean anything. So let's see how that works. An attack card is going to have a range down in the corner. Okay? Typically, it's one or two most of the time. And that is an exact number. So two would mean that this is within range right here, one, two. But this, even though it's closer than two, is not within range of something with range two because it is an exact range. Again, think of it as, in this case, that'd be a range of two for an action that maybe has the character kicking. Perhaps that's the idea that they're so close together they don't have the ability to actually pull their leg up and fully extend it to do the full attack, something like that. So this would be a range one, range two, range three, and so on. How many hexes it takes to get to the other. I just sort of zigzag your way across the arena. Some attacks will also have a range that has a dash. It's a range, literally, for its range. So instead of it being one or two, it's one to two. So one is fine, two is fine. It's not exact. So for instance, for Adriana here, front kick and roundhouse kick have a range of one to two, whereas most kicks in the game actually have a range of two, which basically means you can't be right next to them to kick them because I guess thematically you can't uh, extend your leg the entire length because you're too close to them, that sort of thing. There is also a special range marked with a P. That is a projectile range here. So let's see how this would work. So if we're talking about range one, this is range one range two. So if it says a range of one, you have to be here. Two, you have to be here. One to two, here is fine, or here is fine. If it's a projectile, let's say the character is here. This is one of my favorite mechanics. Say it's a projectile attack. You basically are firing in a straight line. So if he's here, that straight line will work, that straight diagonal. If he's here, or here, or here, a straight line goes across and hits them from here. But just like a 2.5D fighting game, and some you know 2D fighting games have used that terminology to refer to the idea that there is some slight depth where you could sort of sidestep, you can essentially sidestep, and if you're here, his projectile can't reach you because it either goes straight and misses you, or it goes diagonal and misses you. That's why that zigzag pattern with the hexes exists, because it allows that sort of slight depth to the play area from front to back to allow projectile weapons or projectile abilities to be able to be sidestepped. Cool mechanic. Now, while the character is on the end here in this special space with a marker, I would note that all the arenas have a special mechanic built into that specific arena. In this case, it has these little symbols 
that denotes that these are, quote, dangerous edges, essentially like being caught in a corner in a video game. If you are attacked by someone who is adjacent to you when you are in one of those dangerous edge spots, you take one extra heavy wound in the wound pool. So what the heck is a wound pool? Well, let's look at some of these cards. So any of the cards is going to have a symbol up here in the corner. We're going to look at that later because it plays into blocking and combos, but not the actual initial attack at all. But over here, you have what's referred to as the wound pool. These little sort of transparent looking almost X's, that is a symbol for a light wound. The symbol can also be for a heavy wound. As I just mentioned a second ago, what that symbol looks like, High Punch has a heavy wound on it. Aside from the wound pool, the card might also have an effect down here. So we have range, title, wound pool, and effect. There's also a type underneath. This matters. There are reactions, abilities, and strikes. Strikes can be blocked, the other ones can't. There will also be some cards where down in the corner there's this little KO symbol, which means that you can initiate a knockdown test. So assuming that the other character is within range, you're going to go through what's referred to as the attack sequence. So let's assume that our characters are, say, here, within range two. So we'll use cut as our example here because it is a strike, so I can show you how blocking works. We're not going to look at the knockdown test yet. We'll grab that from one of the combos here. So the name doesn't mean anything. So the first thing you're going to do is, okay, we deal with the wound pool. Unless the other character blocks it, they receive whatever wounds are listed here. In this case, a light wound. Light wounds are cubes represented by whatever the lighter color is of the pair of colors that come with that particular volume. So in this case, if we're talking about the attack coming from Shingo onto Varoth, then Varoth takes a light wound. Again, these characters don't have traditional health bars. We will see what that cube is going to do for us later. Then you're going to deal with the effect. Your opponent discards one attack card from their hand. Ouch! So one of these cards would go away. Then if there was a KO symbol, we could do a knockdown test if the attacker wants to do it. And there are reasons why you might not want to. We'll talk about that when we talk about the idea of the tests themselves. Now let's talk about blocking. I said strikes can be blocked. All the different versions of the different cards and whatnot have varying symbols up in the corner. One of the ways this can be used is for a block. If you have a card in your hand that has the little shield symbol on it, you can play this by discarding it and then count the number of cards left in your hand. For every one card in your hand, you can negate one light wound. For every two cards in your hand, you can negate one heavy wound. And those can be used in any combination, as long as you're not essentially recounting the same cards again. So you could use a block by discarding to pay the cost for it and then do that counting to block the wounds that are coming in from the wound pool, or, not and, or you could simply discard the shield card to do a block and cancel out whatever text was coming at you for that one. It's an either-or proposition. If you want to block both the wound pool and the effect, you need to play two of these. So again, the attack sequence, if they're in range, is wound pool, then effect, then a possible knockdown test, but they can block, but if they block, they're blocking wound pool and effects separately, and only if the attack was a strike. Your third option is to launch a combo. And basically that is when the stuff on your character sheet comes into play. For the most part, most of the stuff on your card are going to be strikes or abilities that in some way can be used within a combo. On the other hand, there are some that are reactions that happen as a reaction to something the other player has done, and they are typically in a different color, so it's easier to spot them. But typically, these special attacks, as they are called, will be used within a combo. And a combo is interesting because it is what it sounds like. It is multiple attacks in sequence. It can also include dashes, which is basically just a free form of movement aside from your regular move that turn. So what you would do is you would look over here to the side. Again, there's a range for most of them in terms of how close or far you would need to be for an ability to take effect. Up here is a cost. You are going to have to take those cards from your hand 
that again have those different symbols in the red banner up at the top and discard the specific number and type of symbols necessary to pay whatever that cost is. A question mark is a wild. It could be anything. But you've got sort of the fist there, the yin and yang symbol, and so on. There are some that'll have a little slash here, but not very often. That's an either or type of notification. So you could do either one. And once you have paid the cost, it essentially works like an attack card does. There is a wound pool up here that can take effect. There will be an effect that then takes effect afterwards, same attack sequence. And then if there is a KO symbol, you can initiate a knockdown test. Notice again, they are marked as a different types. As I mentioned, strikes in this form, yes, can be blocked just like strikes on attack cards. What's interesting though, is that what you can do, assuming you have enough cards of the correct payment types in your hand, and your hand is limited to six, by the way. If you ever go beyond six, you have to discard down. As long as you can pay the costs, you can string these together. So let's say that I've got six cards in my hand. Let's say that I have the requisite cards for three of them to play this, for two of them to play this, and I've got one with the dash symbol in it. So what I might do is start out close to the enemy, pay my three either fist or kick symbols, or I guess punch and kick symbols, I guess is what they're supposed to be here, while I'm at range one, deal one heavy wound, and then discard any number of cards to inflict one heavy wound for each discarded cards. Maybe I decide I'm not going to do that because I need my cards to pay for other stuff, but I could have if I wanted to stop there. Then maybe I use that one with the arrow to pay for a dash and jump back from one away to two away, which still keeps me in range for this one. Now I pay with my last two remaining cards, the fist and a wild, to do one more heavy wound and move my opponent one space backward, pushing them to range three, which maybe keeps me safe without uh, them having to waste a movement to get closer to me next round. But the idea is that in any order you like, you can string together as many dashes and as many special attacks as you can afford into a cook a combo with that third option. So move, attack with an attack card, or combo. I would note, by the way, that for that option to attack, you do still have the option of taking a card in case you need its symbol, even if you're not within range. It just means that the attack itself doesn't take effect, but you still get to put the card into your hand, so you've got the symbol there in case you want to pay for any of these. And again, as you're doing that stuff, your skill cards are in effect. So for instance, in this case, if it was Veroth doing it, once per combo action, he could use that dash symbol to, instead of paying for a regular dash, he could use it as any other symbol as if it's wild and pay for something that way. Or in the case of Shingo... If he was playing a low kick as his attack card, which usually doesn't have a KO to initiate a knockdown test, he would have one instead added to it, essentially, by turning that low kick into a heavy kick with his skill card. You got to make sure you pay attention to these as well, but there's all kinds of different circumstances depending on what the ability is, so it's not something to illustrate as we go along here. Just remember that they are something to keep in mind as you're going through the full two actions on a turn with those three options and if you are doing something that involves an attack as you are doing the three-part attack sequence. These always play a role somewhere within the process. Now we keep mentioning knockdown tests. What is that? That's what we're going to look at now and again these are initiated if the attack card you are using for an attack action or a special attack or special ability you are using as part of a combo as you go through the sequence of wound pool then effect then check for the knockdown effect, has that knockdown effect symbol down here, KO. This is where the cubes come into play. There really isn't a difference during regular play. Let's just pile some on poor Veroth here. There isn't really a difference in regular play of a light or heavy wound until the test is resolved. So right now, poor Veroth here has, what, we've got five light wounds, We've got six heavy wounds. He has a total of 11 wounds. If you as the attacker choose to initiate a knockdown test, then it's up to the defending player to pass that test or immediately lose the round. This is the mechanic that determines who wins a round, regardless of when it happens, regardless of how many wound cubes are present to some extent. There are two different ways that you could do a knockdown test. 
The way that was originally built into the game and that is sort of considered the standard is a dexterity test. And I actually don't really like a manual dexterity thing built into my games, so I don't use this one myself, but it is sort of the standard version. There is a dice-based, sort of luck-based one that we will see in a moment as an alternative. Essentially what happens is the attacking player grabs whatever they could use to count down from 10 fairly. And the clock starts, click, 10, 9, 8, 7, and so on, and so on, and so on. Not that fast, that would not be fair. What you have to do then, if you're the defender, is you must take all of your cubes and stack them into one giant stable, at least enough to stay up, tower within 10 seconds. So if I somehow did that in 10 seconds, and I have no idea how long that took, but let's say that was within 10 seconds, then as soon as I've got my tower built, boom, timer stops, I have passed the knockdown test. If, however, the 10 seconds are up and I have not fully built it, I'm knocked out, I lose the round. Which means, of course, that even though the type of wound cube doesn't matter for the test itself, the number of wound cubes is going to make a difference. The more cubes you have to stack, the harder it's going to be to get it done within those 10 seconds without it falling over. Because it does need to be one tall tower. Only one can touch the table. Everything else can only touch two cubes, basically one at the bottom, one at the top is how they describe it. It is just a straight up tower of cubes. The other option is dice based. So each volume has these nice engraved custom dice that are really only here for this alternative form of doing a knockdown test. You would simply roll, probably not on top of your stuff, but you would roll it and then add it up. Five, eight, 14. There were 11 cubes. He survives the knockdown test. The idea here being that you survive as long as what you roll with those three dice is equal to or greater than the number of wound cubes that you have. So essentially, once you get your 19th wound cube, it is literally impossible to pass this version of the knockdown test because the maximum you could roll on three six-sided dice is 18. But as I said, the type of wound cube, heavy or light, doesn't matter for the test itself. It's only after it has been resolved. Now, if you failed the test, you just lost the round. It's over. We'll see what happens next. But let's say you passed it, like he did with the roll here. This is where the type of wound cube actually matters. Heavy wounds stay. Light wounds, you divide in half, rounding down, and discard half of them. So in this case, he's got five light. That would be two and a half. Basically, if you divide it in half, round it down, you get two. Two of his light wounds go away. He has effectively healed by passing the knockdown test. That is why I say it is the choice of the attacking player whether to initiate the knockdown test or not. Because if you do that too early in the process, when they are more likely to be able to survive the test, then you're basically just giving them an opportunity to heal themselves to make it so that it's going to be even tougher the next time you do a knockdown test, unless you deal a lot more damage between now and then to build it back up again. And the more light wounds they have, the more they essentially are able to heal in comparison to those heavy wounds that can't be healed under normal circumstances. That is why heavy wounds are a good thing to deal if you can, because yeah, it's just one cube, like a light wound is just one cube, but they can't heal it easily, so it is built up that will stay over time, unlike the light ones that might get healed if they pass a knockdown test. So let's say someone has just failed their knockdown test. What happens? That player gets a victory token. They have won one of the rounds needed to win, and basically, most everything resets. All the cards that are in the hands, all the cards that are in the attack row here, they get shuffled back into a new attack deck. You lay out the four again, you do the drafting of one, two, one again, except now the first player is whoever lost the previous round, so the one that doesn't have the victory token. You lay out four cards to start out the round again. Wounds get cleared, because it's a new round. And whoever lost the round, who didn't get the benefit of the victory token, who is now going first, let's say it was Varoth who lost, they get to pull out their second skill card and both of them work together. It's basically a handicapping mechanism to allow the character who just lost a round 
a chance to sort of get caught up again by having that other ability in effect that might help them. And yes, if they've both won once and lost once, both of them could have both skill cards active at the same time. You could have four skill cards active in a single game. But you only ever flip over the second one to add to the first one if you lose a round. Otherwise, it remains completely unplayed throughout the game. Finally, there's one other mechanic we should look at before we look at specific abilities that use different components for different games or different characters, and that is that there is a timer built into the game. You start out by pulling four of these and doing that drafting at the beginning to get two cards for each player to start the round. Then you refill four more. You've already used eight out of 36. If there comes a point where all these cards are gone, then essentially the timer for the round has run out. And you do essentially what amounts to a check to see who it is who now wins the round despite not having either of them get knocked out. Just like time running out in something like Street Fighter. The first way to check is who has the fewest heavy wounds. If that's a tie, who has the fewest light wounds? If that is a tie, which character is it that is just now starting their turn, which is what was causing us to try to draw from the attack deck and not have any cards to put out here? Then that character wins. And that is how you play a basic starting game here of Knockdown. It takes longer to explain it than to actually play it. Pick your characters, take their components, grab a help card and a character-specific help card if there is one, set up the arena, put your miniatures on it, do the drafting of the skill cards, set up the attack row and do a draft, set up the attack card row again, put the other components within reach, and go. On your turn, do two actions, either move, attack, or combo. If someone initiates a knockdown test, do it through the dexterity method or the dice method, whichever has been agreed upon. Winner gets a victory token, loser gets to go first next round, and gets to flip over their other skill card. Between rounds, most everything resets otherwise, and whoever wins two rounds wins the game. Now let's look at some special cases. The other player in Volume 1 is... Driana. Let's say you're playing with Driana or against Driana. She has a special ability that requires understanding what is on her specific player help card. She deals with traps. She has an ability where she pays one yin yang symbol as part of a special attack within a combo. And yes, a combo, by the way, can just be one thing if that's all you can pay for. This says to place a trap token face down in your fighter's space. Note, this is only when she is in hunter mode. When she is in archer mode, she doesn't get to do that, but she does have projectile attacks. She has four different trap tokens, all with this symbol on the back, so that you don't know what it is when she lays it. You know it exists, but you don't know what exactly it is you might run into. There's two possible options. So let's say she drops this one, right? She drops it under her space. She then moves away. Some other poor guy stands on it. It takes effect. In this case, what he hit was a whole trap. This is basically uh, going to cause him to discard down to two attack cards and suffer one light wound. If by chance it had been the other one, tree spikes, then the opponent would take two heavy wounds. But that's it, just the two heavy wounds, nothing about discarding for that one. And note here that that's not a strike. So these trap effects can't be blocked. Driana, as the one who's laying them, is immune to her own, so she can step on them anytime she wants, and if they are triggered, they go back into her pool to let her continue using them, which does mean that she can only use, of course, a maximum of four until she's out of them, but the chances of actually having all four out of the board without any being triggered is pretty low. That is a unique ability just for her, and again, she's found in Volume 1. Then there are some special rules to know if you're playing with Volume 2 based on Nemesis. Note here that there are nine spaces here, so that there is sort of a center space to be had. Uh, that is the case for both Volume 2 and Volume 3. The starting spaces, again, are different colors than the rest. So in this case, there are these green lit spaces here. So that would be one of the starting spaces. And notice here, the end spaces and the middle space have a wound symbol next to them. They are the technical corridors, very much like the technical corridors that you could go through in the regular Nemesis game. But in Nemesis, the only one who can go through those corridors unscathed is the mechanic. Anyone else would have to use the promo uh, Dice Tower Kickstarter Crawl deck 
to be able to go through technical quarters, and usually something bad will happen along the way unless you're really lucky with your card draw. This sort of simulates that effect. These three spaces with the symbols are considered connected. When you move, you only move one space, but you can move from here to here, from here to here. All of them are connected. However, whichever one you pop out of, you take whatever the wound is for that space. So if you purposely go to the center or are on one of the ends and you jump to one of the ends, you're gonna take a heavy wound. If you purposely jump from one of the ends to the center, then you're gonna get hit for a light wound. As far as special mechanics for characters, we will start with the Captain, James, who could also in this case be a gunslinger. It's just James, Captain is what he was called in Nemesis, but Captain is just one of his classes he could be in this game. But notice here that when it comes to the cost, sometimes alongside symbols that are found on the cards, there's also a bullet icon here that represents an ammo token. As explained on his help card, he basically has a six shooter as in Nemesis. So he starts the match, not each round, just the match at the very beginning with six ammo tokens, little bullet tokens here. He can spend them just like spending the symbols on the cards by discarding from his hand to pay for special attacks. However, they do not replenish between rounds and he can only have as many as six. That's why he has that ability on the bottom of both sides of his character sheet that lets him reload. He can spend one symbol of any kind, it's wild on either side, to gain one ammo token and discard any number of cards with the yin-yang symbol to gain one additional ammo token for each one of those that he discards. Katie, meanwhile, on her scout side, which is the side that goes with the name of her character from Nemesis, she has the Molotov Cocktail ability. Discard a fist and kick, or I guess a punch and kick symbol among the attack cards in her hand to place the flame token on your opponent's fighter sheet. This is the flame token. And how to use it? Well, that's on her help sheet here. Basically, when the other player starts their turn with that flame token on their fighter sheet, they suffer one heavy wound. And you discard the flame token after the fighter moves during their turn. Note, they have to move. You're basically not only hitting them for a heavy wound, but maybe they didn't want to move. Maybe they were in a good position. You're forcing them to move or to keep that token on their player sheet. So the next round, they get hit again. So they either move or they stay on fire. Stop, drop, and roll, kids. Then lastly, for volume two, we have Puppy, the intruder. Now, on the beast side, there's only one item here of note, which is Scratch. Your opponent takes one contamination card. On the other side, Scratch is present also for the Parasite class. But then you have Pounce. Blink to any space within one to three spaces. Right? Again, blinking means almost like teleporting. If you blink Puppy to a space within one space from your opponent, they take one contamination card. And then evolve down at the bottom, inflict light wounds equal to the number of contamination cards in your opponent's hand. So a lot of stuff dealing with contamination cards. Again, as explained on the help card for that specific character, there are these three contamination cards, all of which are identical here. They say contamination on the back. When a character takes a contamination card, it goes into their hand, and it takes up one of their six slots in their hand. They can only ever have six cards. Now, all of a sudden, they have five useful ones and one thing they can't use. And when they hit their maximum of six, they are not allowed to discard a contamination card to get back down to six. They have to discard one of their useful cards. If Puppy tries to give another contamination card and they have all been sent out already, then Puppy discards one light wound. So they either contaminate you three times, and then if they've still got that contamination going within you, where you only have three useful cards and three contamination cards in your hand, which would suck, they also get the benefit of healing. Note here, though, that you, as the character who has this in their hand, who's been inflicted with contamination, you may discard that card by spending one action. So do this and, you know, then move or then attack, but now you're down to one action left on your turn. But if you do, Puppy still benefits because Puppy discards one light wound that way as well. And these don't disappear from the game or anything. Once any of these have been discarded because you've removed it from your hand, it goes right back into the pool for Puppy to inflict upon you again. Puppy is a contamination machine. That brings us to special rule mechanics for Volume 3, the one based on Tainted Grail. 
As far as the arena is concerned, we again have nine spaces, starting spaces closer together here and colored differently. This is not an actual space that is part of the art, but that represents a men here, as in Tainted Grail, a source of light that is pushing back the miasma of weirdness that is encroaching on the land. And that is basically what gives rise to the mechanic for this particular arena. There will be four candle cards with the same backs as your attack deck cards that get shuffled into the attack deck. When the first one is drawn, you will place candle tokens on the far ends of the track. When the second one is drawn, they move in. Third, they move in again. Fourth, they move in again. And the idea here is that those candles represent where the safe area is versus where the weirdness has encroached. So during play, if you are on a space inside the lit area, basically not the one with the candle, but anything in between the candles, you're safe. The men here is pushing back the weirdness. You're not being affected by it. But if you are on a space lined up with one of the candles or beyond the candles, then the light has shrunk down. The men here is fading. That's actually what they call the mechanic, the fading men here mechanic. The light is fading. You are no longer protected in those areas. And at the end of your turn, if you are still in one of those spots, you take one heavy wound automatically. Now let's talk about fighter specific mechanics. Lost Knight has a pretty basic one. It's not found on his hollow armor side, only on his slayer side. And it's this stun mechanic here. Spend a yin-yang symbol and a defense symbol there with a range of one as a strike and place the stun token on your opponent's fighter sheet. The stun token is this thing here. You just stick it on their sheet. And as explained on his special rule card, basically just when a fighter starts their turn with a stun token on their fighter sheet, the token goes away, but they can only perform one action. So pretty light as far as effects go. Not as powerful as some of the other ones we've seen or will see. Now for Mistbearer, there's two different special mechanics depending on which side you're on. If you're on the Pharah side, then what you're dealing with here is Mist tokens. You can use Magic Mist, this one here, to either remove all the Mist tokens from the arena or place one new mist token on any chosen space. So you would take a mist token and just place it wherever. If a character is on the mist token, you could use mist power to inflict two light wounds on each fighter standing on a mist token or to remove two light wounds from any fighter standing on a mist token, depending on if you want to hurt them or help you, depending on who is standing on the token. But anyone standing on the token, as noted on the character help card, cannot start a combo action while on a space with a missed token. That then, of course, limits you to just move and attack. For the wild side, it's all about the curse token. Okay? And basically everything except chain pull has something to do with it. So curse at the bottom lets you place the curse token on your opponent's fighter sheet. Once it is on there, there is a natural effect. There's the token there. And the natural effect is that their hand limit is now four cards maximum. If they already have more than that, they have to discard down immediately. They can only remove the curse token themselves by discarding three attack cards that all have the same symbol, which is tough to do to get a collection of those when you've got a hand limit of four. You're going to have to keep cycling through to try to match those up to get rid of it. Or Mistbreaker might want to use a combo that involves a knockdown test. The only option there is the one there at the top, which is Doom, which includes removing the curse token from your opponent's fighter sheet. So there is a way that Mistbearer might actually remove it for you, probably only to inflict it again very soon. Then you also have the Vengeance option down here. If your opponent has the curse token, you can discard one heavy wound from your fighter sheet and place it on their fighter sheet, essentially carrying the wound over from you to them. And again, it's one of the ones that is very difficult in this game to heal because usually healing is only applied to light wounds, except for a one card, for instance, you can get uh, in Nemesis, for example. Then we have Maggot from Volume 3. He's going to use Snake Fist up there at the top, place a poison token on your opponent's fighter sheet. He can also use Expunge to discard all poison tokens from your opponent's fighter sheet and inflict two heavy wounds for each discarded token. He actually comes with two of the tokens so he could basically inflict it twice 
remove them all at once for four heavy wounds total. Then on either side, you have the Prepare Potion and Use Potion abilities. Prepare Potion is to flip any unprepared potion token to its ready side. Then Use Potion, use any ready potion and flip it to the unprepared side. Pretty obvious, get it ready, use it back and forth, back and forth between those bottom two listings there. And it's the same thing on the Wise Man side. What the potions do and what the poison does while it's still on the character are all explained on his character help card. The poison token, if it's on the character's fighter sheet, when they start their turn, they take one light wound. And it is cumulative, so if they have both tokens, they take two light wounds. That's at the start of any turn, not when Maggot does anything. Though again, he could remove it with Expunge and do those heavy wounds. A Mystic Potion works at range 1 through 3. So 1, 2, or 3, either way. And basically, if you use this token, your opponent has to show you all the cards in their hand and you get to take one of them. A poison potion is basically just another way to inflict poison at range one, two, or three. Basically, you can use this to place a poison token on their sheet, which lets you use it even if you're not using the poisoner class for him, so he doesn't lose access necessarily. He just can't do it straight from his sheet. He has to use a potion to do it. And then finally, quite powerful, we have a healing potion. This lets you discard half of your heavy wounds rounded down or all of your light wounds. Very powerful stuff here. I would also note one other mechanic specific to Tainted Grail is that the Weirdness attack cards, the five of these, because again, there are five of two different types specific to each volume. In this case, this particular special card for this volume has two symbols up in the corner rather than just one. You can use them both at the same time, but they all have to be used to pay for the same attack. It can't be that you're using one here and one there. They must be used simultaneously. If you just use one, the other one's lost. We will, by the way, do one quick run through of all the different card types very quickly at the end of this, just to make sure it's clear how they work. That brings us to the standalone characters. We'll look at Clayto first. Clayto and Chili will both say the same thing on one of their sides, essentially here of their help card. And that is just that they don't have a regular fighter sheet. Their fighter sheet is made of three cards. So this is essentially the first configuration as Tidebringer, then the second configuration here as Patroness. But either way, there's only one special attack on here that has anything to do with her special mechanic, which is Blessing Draft. She has three Blessing cards. They each have a different special thing that she gets, like Swiftness of Hermes. You may move one additional space using Move, Action, and Dash. Your Move, Actions, and Dashes gain Blink. Pretty cool. She also has the Wisdom of Athena and Might of Zeus. At the beginning of a given round, she chooses one to be active. If she wants to change it at any point during the round, she uses the Blessing Draft ability by spending one Wild Symbol by discarding it from her hand to select one Blessing card and make it active, but she can only have one active at a time. So it's just a switch, not to add. That again is available regardless of which class because it's on both sides. Then for our final character, we have Chili the Business Penguin from Etherfields. This was a Kickstarter exclusive. As his help card notes here, he is like Clayto in that his character sheet is made of three cards again for the Globe Trotter or Gentleman Configurations. Now his does use his specific mechanic a little bit more often. And for that, you're going to need his help card because it has basically the rules to go with some specific tokens that he's going to have. He is going to start each round with five suitcase tokens, each one of which has a different effect on its opposite side. They all affect range one or two. It's a range of one to two. You have the ability to cause the enemy to discard one card or two cards, to take a heavy wound, to take two light wounds, or to allow yourself to blink up to two spaces. They're replenished after each round. The primary way to use them is on either of his classes for the shared ability Stroke of Luck. Draw one suitcase token and resolve it, discard it afterward. You see that for Gentleman, and it's also there for Globetrotter. Notice also, though, that he has other abilities closely tied to the suitcase tokens, which makes his a little more integrated than Cleato, though with Cleato or Cleato, however you're supposed to say it, hers is a persistent effect. So we have Prudent Display, where you discard one heavy wound for each suitcase token in your discard pile when you use that, one of the few times you can heal 
a heavy wound. Now that's all the Globetrotter can do with it, but the Gentleman can inflict one light wound for each suitcase token in your discard pile if you use Suitcase Jump. There is an ability on this same card called Suitcase Throw, but it has nothing to do with the suitcases themselves. But then on the other card, aside from Stroke of Luck, that lets you just use the token's ability, just like on the other class, you also have Pardon Me. When your opponent moves within one space of you, you may discard one suitcase token and blink to any space within one to three. Another important mechanic to know here as we sort of round things out before we do a quick look at the attack cards is that you can randomize in this game. There's a built-in randomization feature through these tokens. You can randomize to determine which of the 11 fighters, or presumably 10 at retail because Chili is Kickstarter exclusive, which of the fighters each player will play as. They all have this symbol on the back, so you simply flip them over, mix them up, draw, and you could play as Shin Go, Baroth, Driana, James, Katie, Puppy, Maggot, Miss Bear, Lost Knight, Clayto, or Chili. Then you can use these tokens here to randomize which arena you're going to play with. It's all based on the background and the logo that's present. They have this symbol on the back denoting, you know, the box being turned into the play area. Remember, by the way, that the attack deck you're going to use is locked to the arena itself. So this is choosing your arena and your attack deck because they're all kind of one unit. You want to change the skill cards you're using, the skill deck, that's going to come down to these randomizers here, based on the way the card backs look, and they've got the symbol there of a skill. Now very quickly here, let's go through the attack cards. We're going to ignore the symbols up in the corner because, again, they will vary. But let's talk about the actual wound pool, effect if any, KO effect, range, and attack type for anything in the attack decks. It's going to be easy because there's only two unique card types in each set. So regardless of set here, you're going to find that Low Punch will have a wound pool of two light wounds. It will have a range of only one. It will be considered a strike. There is no effect, and you will be able to initiate a knockdown test using it. You'll always have seven of these in the attack deck. You will also always have seven High Punch cards, which have a wound pool of one heavy wound, no effect, can initiate a knockdown test, is also a range of one, and is also a strike. You will always have six low kicks in the attack deck. They always give you one light wound in the wound pool. They do have an effect. Move your opponent one space backward. They have a range of two. Again, that's not one or two, but two exactly. It is a strike, but this cannot initiate a knockdown test. Then finally, of the ones that are always the same, we have six copies of high kick in each deck, which give you a wound pool of two light wounds, no effect, it's a range of exactly two, it is a strike, but also it cannot initiate a knockdown test. So in general, a KO effect symbol will be on the punches, but not the kicks. The punches will be range one, the kicks will be range two, they are all strikes. It's only a question of what type of wounds are in the wound pool and if there's an effect or not. And the only one that has an effect is low kick. That's among the ones that all the decks have in common. Then again, each attack deck for each volume will have two unique cards just for that volume that appear five times within that volume's attack deck. In the case of volume one for Siege Storm, it's Cut and Bash. For both of them, the wound pool is one light wound. The effects and range are different. They are both strikes. Neither has a KO effect. In the case of Cut, the effect is that your opponent discards one attack card from their hand. It's a range of exactly two. Bash, move your opponent one space backward, move your fighter one space forward. You initiate it at a range of one. For volume two, which is the Nemesis volume, you have Uppercut and Synthetic Food. Uppercut is the strike at range one that has a wound pool of one light wound and ability after passing a KO test, your opponent doesn't discard wounds, which is kind of nice. And yes, it makes sense then that this can initiate a knockdown test. Notice though that the other one is not a strike. There's no wound pool. There's no KO effect. Instead, this is an ability. The ability is discard one heavy wound or one light wound. And yes, I know the glare kind of sucks in here, especially on the cards from Nemesis. I apologize. And finally, for Volume 3, your two unique ones just for that volume. Just like with Nemesis, it's one strike and one ability. The strike is a throw, 
that is a wound pool of one light wound. The effect, blink your opponent to any space within one to two spaces of your fighter. You started at range one, which would make sense. And again, that is the strike. We then have weirdness, which is that one that is special because it has two symbols up here in the corner that you could use to pay for things, but you got to use them all at once. It is an ability, so no wound pool, no KO effect symbol, and no range, just an effect. After taking this card, suffer one light wound. So you have the benefit of being able to pay for things a little bit better, more easily, but you suffer a light wound in order to get it in the first place, so you better plan ahead for which cards you're going to take when you do an attack and pull from the four. And that, folks, is how you play Knockdown. Basics first, then specifics second. I hope that approach was useful to you rather than just doing basics or getting lost in the weeds right from the get-go. Hopefully it was a nice balance here. But again, this is applicable whether you are playing with Volume 1 based on Siege Storm, Volume 2 based on Nemesis, or Volume 3 based on Tainted Grail with or without working those standalone characters into the mix. Personally, my favorite's Volume 2, the one based on Nemesis, but I'm a big fan of Nemesis anyway, though I am a fan of all three of the games that the core boxes are based on. Again, you can take a look at every single component in the game, get some more information as we go along about where these come from, where these characters are based, and how even things like the miniatures and components and abilities compared to the original games these characters come from for any of the ones in the three core boxes, in my exhaustive content overview video for Knockdown here on the channel. Hopefully, this has you interested in checking out Knockdown. It's definitely a game that needs some love. It plays fast, it's fun, and because of its size, it's also not particularly expensive, especially if you only stick with one volume, the one that appeals to you the most. Thanks for watching. I hope this helped.